by recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or uh, capital Israel. of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as G Genesis 12 says God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this. And then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And um, it's a miracle that it took place. Hello and welcome everybody to another video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. But it's not only Jörg who does this video, it's uh, together again in collaboration with my wonderful brother in Christ over there in the United States of America, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. And we are gathered here together today for the 92nd edition, the 92nd study of End Time Delusions and this special part, Exploding the Israel Deception, which has been very interesting last time when we taught you about the Catholic roots of Zionism. And I think that if 500 people watched that video, it's fine. If 1,000 watched it, that's fine too. But it should be 1,000 multiplied with 500 at least who watch that and understand what was said there. Because this really is part of the greatest deception of the Garden of Eden, uh, since the Garden of Eden. To say that the Zionists rule anything in this world and equate them with Jews. That is the bad thing that happens in this world. Zionists rule, that's right. But the Zionists are Roman Catholic and they use every means to, uh, to reach their goal. The end justifies the means. And that is not by accident the motto of the Jesuit order. Before I introduce Tom to you for this reading today, and before we start our 92nd study, still in the wonderful chapter, An Unsinkable Doctrine, 1948, question mark, I have found something that I want to show you, and that comes from a book that is from Edmond Paris, who you probably know if you followed my readings on that, on The Secret History of the Jesuits, a book that he has written. He has written many books, and uh, one of the many books that he has written, published in 1959, was uh, Le Vatican contre Europe, which is in English called The Vatican Against Europe. The English translation is from 1961, and I just happen to have that book physically in my possession, 
and I was uh, going through it a little bit, started reading it, and I was astonished about what was to be read in chapter one. And that's why I asked my German sister, Miss Marple, she's called, she calls herself on YouTube, and she is going to translate probably the complete book into German. But that's another thing. I then opened, quote unquote, by accident, and we all know accidents don't exist. Huh? It's always the leading of the spirit who does this on page 238 of the book. And I'm going to show you what page 238 of that book says. It's right here. It says, it was especially on the Eastern Front that the evangelizing hero and his helmeted missionaries were fighting the good fight at Majorum Dei Gloriam. So speaking about the Second World War, of course. And at Majorum Dei Gloriam is a Jesuit motto, which means to the greater glory of God. It was there that gigantic holocausts were being offered up to heaven. It was there, in accordance with the wish of the Jesuit father Mackerman, already quoted earlier in this book, that men were living a heroic period, quote, by shedding their blood for Christ. Page 238, Edmund Paris, the Vatican against Europe. Men were living a heroic period by shedding their blood for Christ? No, Christ shed his blood for us, not we, our blood for Christ, and especially not the Christ of the Roman Catholic Church. And again, we have this gigantic holocaust mentioned here, and that's why I thought this would be an interesting little quote to start in the beginning of our discussion today and to introduce Tom to the broadcast. Hello, brother Tom. Nice to see you. Great to have you back and welcome to the broadcast today. Yes, it's my pleasure, privilege and blessing to be here. And uh, this is a remarkable find that you have found in Edmund Paris's book. And uh, I can't wait to hear again uh, what your conclusions are about it. And I have to I have to agree with every word that you've said about it. It's it's just a stunning find, you know. Every now and then we'll we'll stumble onto something accidentally, and uh, it, it's uh, it's it's like finding a gold nugget. Yeah. And it really it really really answers questions that we never even thought to ask, and and that's why we know that the Lord is behind this research. And uh, he just leads us along, and every now and then he'll reward us for our efforts by, by piecing together another extraordinary piece of information. And uh, I'll, I'll shut up now and let you tell the listeners about it. Oh, by the way, when you put that text up from Edmund Paris's book, if you, could, if you could increase the size of it a little bit so I can, so I can see it better. But it's just a, a remarkable a remarkable piece of literature, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say about it. Yeah, I, I was not going to a uh, deeper study of this little subject, but more to, uh, to the point that it is the quote-unquote accident, and as you correctly said, it is the leading of the Holy Spirit into all truth, as Jesus Christ promised us that he would do when he goes away, that he sends the Comforter who would lead us into all truth, first and foremost by studying the Bible, but second of all also, I think, by doing what the Bereans did in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, when they were better Jews as the one at Thessalonica, because they uh, held everything in this world daily against the Bible, and sought th and saw if those things were so. And that's exactly what we are doing. It is today the 1st of June. It has been a fortnight until we recorded our last study, number 91, where we were talking about the um, Catholic roots of Zionism. And in the meantime, I was led to pick that book up, which was resting here on my desk for a year, and I haven't touched it. And all of a sudden, I get that open, and I think this, I, I find this wonderful first chapter, which I'm not going to share now what that about, because that would really go too far, but it is uh, a part of my German study of modern wars that I'm doing for the moment. And then, by accident, by <laughs> quote-unquote accident, by the leading of the Spirit, I opened the PDF that I have in the book on page 238, and I saw this quote. And to me, this is absolutely a sign that the Holy Spirit leads us to this because this is uh, in subject 
to our last study we did a fortnight ago. Uh, how can that be? That book lying here on my desk more than a year, I don't touch it. And in the week, in the week after we do that study on the on the Zionists and the Holocaust, and with with the mentioning of um, that that was mentioned in the uh, Douay Rhymes Bible uh, as a Holocaust, the offerings that were mentioned in the King James Bible using the word Holocaust only in the Douay Rhymes Bible, then leading up to this quote here on page 238, which of course I can read again and we can uh, uh, um, discuss a little bit what it says here. It was especially on the Eastern Front of the Second World War, that is, that the evangelizing hero and his helmeted missionaries were fighting the good fight at Maiorum de Gloriam. So who was that evangelizing hero and his helmeted missionaries? I don't know because I haven't read the book in these pages, but I know that it is about the Jesuits and it is about the probably the SS, the storm uh, troops of the German well, uh, of the German Reich in that time. And, yeah, and, the Eastern, the, and the Eastern Front would be Poland, wouldn't it? And the Eastern Front would in the beginning be Poland, and later on then yes. uh, it would be it would go into Russia. And, and the, the point the, is what what they did there, Tom. Just let me uh, say this one sentence. Sure eager to, to hear what you have to say, but you probably don't even know that. Um, what they did was they sent the Wehrmacht, which is the, the norm, quote unquote normal German military up front. They did the Blitzkrieg. Yeah? They uh, conquered whole of Poland within six weeks. But after the uh, Wehrmacht came the SS, the Schutzstaffel, the SS of which Hitler said that he will form the SS after the example of the Jesuit order and Himmler is his Ignatius of Loyola. They have the motto Ad Majorum Dei Gloriam and that's why I think that these helmeted missionaries must speak about the SS, the Schutzstaffel, which did another war behind the Wehrmacht and they did a war of, we, we say in German, Verbrannte Erde, burned earth. They didn't leave one stone upon the other. Total destruction was behind them. Everything they devoured, it, it reminds me of the beast in Revelation chapter 13, which stamps upon the residue with its feet, you know, Tom? Mm -hmm. These yes. wonderful verses of the Bible. That's what sure. that reminds me to. And then saying it was there that gigantic holocausts, plural, yeah. were being offered up to heaven. What heaven wants these gigantic holocausts? Not the heaven of our creator God. I'm very sure of that. But please, Tom, I'd like to hear your comments on this. Subject. Well, first of all, to, to capitalize on a point that you made earlier, nowhere in the Bible are God's people, the church, the called out ones. Never are we instructed to kill anyone. Never are we uh, called to shed blood. And certainly we ha have spent uh, 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 the lion's share of our time telling the people that it was Daniel who prophesied that Messiah the Prince, Jesus, who would come in the, in, the, in the beginning of the 70th and final week of Daniel, would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Okay? Now, here we have uh, an author who is using language that is extraordinarily prophetic, extraordinarily historically accurate. And remember last time we talked about the use of the word Holocaust found only, only in the Roman Catholic Bible, the, the, Douai, the Douai Reims Bible, where it talks about the sacrifice, where it talks about uh, instead of uh, an offering, uh, 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 an offering like uh, they did on uh, Temple Mount in Jerusalem, a sacrifice wholly and acceptable to God, they call it a holocaust in the Roman Catholic Bible. It's called the holocaust, a sacrificial offering 
is called a holocaust. And only in the Douay Reims Bible, no other Bible uses that word. And here we have Edmund Paris in his book talking about the Jesuits and the Eastern Front, the war in Poland, where so many of Europe's Jews were destroyed in the crematoriums, so many atrocities against the Jews, and they used the very same word from the Douay Reims Bible to name it the Holocaust. And what we get from this is that the Jesuits and the and the and the and the Nazi regime that attacked the Eastern Front went into Poland and began to persecute and to murder hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Jews. It was a sacrifice. It was a Roman Catholic Holocaust. And we know also from the Jesuit order, not only is there saying ad majorum de glorium, one of the one of the uh, uh, mottos of the Jesuit order, unique to them only, is this part of their oath that says no one can enter the 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 the, uh, the kingdom of heaven until he has shed blood. Okay, a Jesuit is required to shed blood. Now, again, I emphasize the point that you made earlier and the point that I reiterated was never, ever, ever in the Bible are, the, are God's saints commanded to shed the blood of the wicked or anyone else for that matter. And, or our uh, own, Tom. Or our pardon? own. By shedding yes. their blood for Christ, you know. It, it speaks yeah. about like the soldiers have to shed their blood for Christ. Christ yeah. doesn't doesn't say that we have no. to uh, shed Jesus our blood. Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Yeah, the point is that he was the yeah. he was the one who shed his blood for us. That's right. Not we yeah. are shedding our blood for him. That, that, that's just it's, it's 180 degrees turning around what the Bible says here. Now we can see in Edmund Edmund Paris's book the the very mentality of the Antichrist of Rome and his Jesuit order. And this is why to this day, the, 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 the persecution and the execution, the mass murder, the genocidal murders of the Jews in, 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 in Europe, and especially Poland, is called a Holocaust. It's a Roman Catholic word to describe a Roman Catholic sacrifice. Now, to get back to the very, the very root of our discussion, the, 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 the Roman Catholic roots of Zionism, why are they killing, mass murdering, genocidal slaughter of the Jews in Poland and in Europe? To force the rest of world Jewry to seek sanctuary and peace and safety in a modern nation state of Israel where the Vatican intends to fulfill as best it can a refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel to make the Jews force the Jews down to that homeland and to naturally expect them once they've returned to their homeland to rebuild the temple and then naturally to begin uh, sacrifices or holocausts, as the Roman Catholic Bible says, and then in the midst of a seven-year period of time, somebody, whoever the Vatican chooses to do it, has to cause those sacrifices and oblations to cease. And at that point, the whole of Christendom, uh, the whole of apostate Christendom will be irrecoverable Retrievably convinced that that individual, whoever caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease, is was the Antichrist. Okay? Now they could choose Donald Duck to do it. That's just how ridiculous all this is. And the world would be convinced every Christian would be on his rooftop shouting, the Antichrist, the Antichrist, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. That is the Antichrist. Now, what does that do? 
That exonerates the papacy. That's what futurism is all about. That's what it accomplished when it was first began to be preached in this country in the early 1800s. It destroyed the Protestant Reformation, which proved that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. That is the cue and cry of the Protestant reformers. Come out of the Roman Catholic Church before it's too late. It is the Church of Antichrist, and the papacy is the Antichrist. So now they all believe in a future Antichrist, don't they? And he's not proved to be existent in the world unless he causes the sacrifices and oblation, the Holocaust in the Jewish temple to come to an end, to cease. See, if you believe that future malarkey, as I did for the most of my life, if you believe in that future pipe dream, that Roman Catholic Jesuit lie that has deceived the whole world, then you can't believe the truth, which is, Every pope in succession, from the very first pope to the very last pope, is the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. So saith God in the Scriptures, so saith the Protestant Reformers, so saith history, so saith prophecy, and so says common sense. But the whole world believes a ridiculous lie. And here's what it took to pull off this pipe dream. They had to create a modern nation state of Israel. They had to persecute the world's Jews so that they would flee to that land because the Jews knew that God kicked them out of the land unless he restored them with the same miraculous power that he did when he delivered them from Egyptian bondage 4,000 years ago. They would never go back to that land. Never go back to that land unless God demonstrated his strong right arm like he did when he led them out of captivity, out of the house of bondage in Egypt. The Jews were never going to go back to that land. And so the Vatican was faced with a dilemma that was going to sink their futurist fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. So they resorted to war. And that's why Roman Catholic Hitler was used for that war. And that's why the Jesuit general was used for that war. That's why the Jesuits were used for that war. The Roman Catholic shock troops, the Jesuits, were the only ones who could pull off a mass genocidal persecution and a slaughter and holocaust, a holy sacrifice to the Roman Catholic Church. Why? Because the end justifies the means. If killing six million Jews in such a horrific fashion as a crematorium could, could terrorize the whole Jewish world, then all they would have to do is open the gates in their former homeland and they would flee without God's strong right hand. Now listen, every Bible preacher, every futurist moron in the Christian world is going to tell you over and over and over that the creation of the modern nation state of Israel in 1948 was a prophetic fulfillment, a divine act. They're all going to tell you this because they're futurists. They must have that future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel because they deny the historical fulfillment of it in Jesus 2,000 years ago. In the midst of the week, in the midst of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy, Messiah the Prince caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease because he became the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. The sacrifice, the only sacrifice that can take away sin, the only sacrifice that God provided his only begotten son is the only sacrifice whereby a man can be forgiven for his sin. There is no other name under heaven whereby you must be saved than that of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of Almighty God. And he fulfilled that prophecy perfectly and completely 2,000 years ago.
There is no future 70th week of Daniel. To deny or to say that the, the 70th week of Daniel is yet future is to deny Christ's fulfillment of it. You are yet in your sins. You are yet desirous of a sacrifice, and you've denied Christ. And what they're going to do in Jerusalem is the answer to the final Jewish question. Make them cause to, them to, to, to make animal sacrifices so that they may eat and drink damnation to themselves. If Hitler and all the Jesuits and all the wars that they propo proposed to kill off the world's Jews were unsuccessful in killing the whole world's Jews, then all you got to do is give them a homeland after that unbelievable persecution and cause them to build a temple. The one that God destroyed in 70 AD, raised to the ground, rebuild that temple and cause them to do what they did after Jesus gave the sacrifice, and that is continue to make animal sacrifices to eat and drink damnation to themselves in a perfect rejection of Jesus. That's what it is. When the Jew makes a sacrifice, he rejects Jesus by his actions. Just like the Roman Catholic Church does every time they celebrate the Mass. It is another holocaust, according to the Roman Catholic Douay Reims Bible. It is a sacrifice when Jesus, the Lamb of God, caused all sacrifices and oblations to cease. That's how you know the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan. That's how you know the Jews that have been so-called restored to the land when they begin animal sacrifices. So this is another subject. Can you imagine that if God was behind this creation of the modern nation state of Israel, that it would be over 70 years since they took possession of the land and there's still no temple on Temple Mount. There's still no sacrifice. You can't come to any other conclusion. If you've got a brain in your head and a spirit full of the Holy Ghost, you can't come to any other conclusion but that God prevents his people, the Jewish people, from returning to animal sacrifices so that they may eat and drink damnation to themselves. This is how God is fighting the Antichrist of Rome. He is preventing, by whatever means necessary, the rebuilding of that temple so that the Jews may not resume their abominable sacrifices. Doesn't it make sense? Doesn't that just have that, that, that ring of truth that, that just stirs in the marrow of your bones, that you cannot get out of your mind? You cannot deny it. It makes too much sense. It makes too much scriptural sense. It makes too much prophetic sense. It makes too much historical sense. Let me spell it for you. Historical sense. And it makes too much common sense to deny. The purpose of the First and Second World War were a Zionist, a Roman Catholic Zionist persecution of the Jews and preparation for the creation of a modern nation state of Israel so that they could perpetrate upon the Jews their ultimate, utter annihilation, spiritually if not physically, cause them to eat and drink damnation to themselves, just like the Roman Catholics do. Are you convinced who the Antichrist is now? Or do you still think it's some single individual that hasn't even reared his diabolical head yet in the world? You've been deceived. All of Christendom has been deceived. They all believe the lie. And you need to know the truth. And thanks to Yerk, and thanks to the Holy Spirit for opening that book, the Vatican against Europe, and the realization that the Holocaust of the Jews was a Roman Catholic agenda. And the Roman Catholic Church is the sole Zionist 
movement in the world. And they made it look like a Jewish movement when it was the Jews that would never go back to that land without God's direct hand to lead them. And so they had to do World War I and World War II to force them down. And every preacher, however you'll name him, no matter how famous, no matter how popular, no matter how beloved by his listeners, will tell you that was a divine miracle. The formation of the Roman, uh, the, the Vatican's, or the, the, the modern nation state of Israel. Now you know better. Back to you, Yerk. Correct me if I'm wrong there, Tom, but when the Jews returned from Babylonian captivity, wasn't the first thing they built the temple? Yes, it and was. And around the, the temple, they built the streets and the uh, and the city of Jerusalem and the walls, even in troubling troublous times. But the first thing they built was the temple. So now to bring, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm so if God to... if God led them in uh, 1948 back to their homeland, why haven't they built the temple then first, but built a country? that has been in war and uproar ever since, and they don't have a temple yet. It doesn't make any biblical sense in that regard, eh? Because first, yep. you, when you gather your people, you have to make sure that your people have a possibility to get rid of their sins. If that story was true, that the Jews still needed sacrifices to get rid of their sins, then God would allow them already living in the nation state of Israel since 1948 without any remission of sins. Is that what a loving God does? That's right. The temple would have been built before the, before the Jews flooded back into the land. It would be that necessary, just like it was after coming out of the Babylonian captivity. The first order of business was to establish the temple. And uh, the Bible records that, the most infallible record of history we have. That was God's priority. The restoration of that temple came first before the people returned to the land. And you can obviously understand why. The Jews have no salvation if they don't have Temple Mount worship and a sacrifice. And uh, uh, they were still under the old economy. Uh, Jesus hadn't come yet. The Lamb of God had not yet come. And so that's all they had was the sacrificial system of the Temple Mount. Nowadays, like I said before, it's been 70 years since the establishment and still no temple. 70 years since the establishment of Israel, 1948, still no temple, no sacrifice. Anybody think God is uh, at work in this? I do. Another, another I'm here words, to tell you, I do. In other words, Tom, the loving God of heaven leaves them in agony because they don't have a temple to get rid of their sins. Leaves them without a sacrifice, leaves them without a temple, leaves them without hope. It would be the equivalent of you and me without the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, do you really think God is in on this uh, establishment of the modern nation state of Israel? And here's something you brought up the other day that just came to mind. You talked about Barry Chamish. You talked about the, the deeding of the old Temple Mount and much of the old city of Jerusalem to the papacy by Shimon Perez, a 33rd degree Freemason. Shimon Perez gifted the Temple Mount where God's temple is supposed to reside. He deeded Temple Mount and a good portion of the old city of Jerusalem to the papacy, sixty percent to be administrator correct. of the Temple Mount, where God's temple is uh, prophetically to be built, according to all the Bible prophets that you'll hear. And I could name them, Lord. I would love to name them. You would recognize all of them. You would see their faces before your eyes. They all preach this, and it's a lying wonder that anybody ever believed a word they said. They don't understand the Bible. They don't understand history. They don't understand prophecy. Why? Because they're futurists. That's how lethal futurism is. That is why I've spent 20 years of my life debunking futurism. 
it has consequences to the spiritual lives of God's people that I can't even articulate. And people say I'm pretty articulate, but I can't tell you the horror that is futurism. Anybody who reads their Bible knows that if the Jews have been called back to that land by God, there would have first been built the temple. Yerk, you hit it right on the head. And here it is, 70 years later, no temple, no sacrifice. And the Jews put up with attacks from every side. Does that look like the strong arm of God to you? And I, you can name them. Good. Would I love to name a certain name that is so popular and has come out preaching what a, what a divine miracle a divine providence, the modern nation state of Israel was in 1948. Still no temple, still no sacrifice. Because he's a futurist. He came out of the Roman Catholic Church. And my guess is he's still a closet Catholic. He's still a closet Catholic. He is not to be trusted. My listeners all know his name. And it's up to the Holy Spirit and to willing hearts to admit the undeniable truth. Anybody that tells you that the formation of the modern nation state of Israel in 1948 was God's prophetic hand in action is a futurist a diabolical shill for the, the greatest Zionist on the planet, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of Rome, the papacy. Once a Catholic, unless God washes your robes, you're going to remain a Catholic, and what you say will find you out every time. And he's like Roman Catholic, I guarantee you. He's a Jesuit-controlled, futurist monster, and he's got everybody listening to him, everybody lauding him for all of his wonderful works. And they are wonderful. I'm here to attest to it myself. But now I know the truth, and you better know the truth, too. Anybody, again, that tells you that God established the modern nation state of Israel in 1948 is a liar. And now you know why and how to tell. And uh, I, just, I just can't, I just can't tell you what it is to read in Edmund Paris's book. The very word Holocaust, right out of the Roman Catholic Douay Reims Bible, to describe the sacrifice of the Jews in Second World War by the Nazi regime. And after they had done their dirty work, the Jesuits took over. Why? Because they are the movers and the shakers of the, Zion, the Roman Catholic, or rather the papal Zionist agenda. When you talk about Zionism, you're talking about the Vatican's fulfillment of the future 70th week of Daniel. And, it, and Rome has been successful in making Zionism look like a Jewish agenda simply by putting Jews in front of the cameras, Jews in history. They can be deceived just like I was to help the Vatican achieve her Zionist aims for the modern nation state of Israel. It's a deception of the whole world. It's the exoneration of the papacy as the Antichrist. They're going to put somebody else up to cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. That is only if God allows them to build a temple. And so far it hasn't happened. And no Christian can explain to you if this is a divine, if this is a divine act by God, this modern nation state of Israel. Why, after 70 years, is there still no temple, still no sacrifice? Jews living in the land, dying spiritually because they have no sacrifice. They haven't received Jesus. 
And it doesn't look like they ever will as long as they maintain hope in a temple and a man, and an animal sacrifice. Look, which one of us, the, the ones who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, the only sacrifice that can take away sin, the sacrifice to end all sacrifices, the propitiation of sin for every man for all time. Which one of us would go to an altar and offer a lamb, a sacrifice? Which one of us would be so ignorant and so thankless as to offer another sacrifice? Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. The redemption of man was finished. Why in the world would you offer another sacrifice? And yet, that's what the Roman Catholic Church does every week. At least once a week, they offer another sacrifice. A propitiatory sacrifice. One by which grace is infused. That's what they say about it. But first, they have to change the, the, the bread into the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Never mind that it still looks like bread. It still smells like bread. It still tastes like bread. Those are just accidents. But in reality, in truth, according to Roman Catholic del delusion, it is the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ to be sacrificed again and again and again and again on the altars of the Roman Catholic Church. You can't imagine, you can't construct in your own mind a more devious, a more diabolical, a more damnable doctrine than a man-made piece of bread to be the atonement of man's sins, much less to call it the literal blood, body, and soul, and divinity of Christ to crucify him perpetually in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, maybe some of you can understand just how diabolical that is. But I'm here to tell you simply, if they make sacrifice as they do every day in the Roman Catholic Church, in the mass, the mass of the Roman Catholic Church, they deny the blood of Christ. And that's what goes down on the records in the books of heaven. He denied the blood of my son. He made his own sacrifice, made with his own hands, or the hands of another sinful, wicked, idolatrous man who worshipped a piece of bread like a god and attributes salvation and grace from that man-made object. That is the epitome of idolatry. It is condemned in every manner in the Bible. And that sin will never be forgiven. The Eucharist is Amen. the mark of Cain. That's right. The Eucharist is a damnable heresy, and I mean it in the proper sense. And so is a Jew who goes back down to Israel or even stays in New York City and makes a sacrifice and calls it a propitiation. He has eaten and drunk damnation to himself. He has rejected the blood of the only begotten son, the only sacrifice that God ever gave. The only one that can take away sins. All the animal sacrifices of history pointed toward Jesus. There's no salvation in the blood of lambs and goats and pigeons and doves. There's no remission of sins. They only are outward signs of their belief in the coming Messiah. And he came 2,000 years ago, and in the midst of that seven-year period of time, he did what he was prophesied to do. He became the sacrifice. God provided the sacrifice, and it did wash away all our sins. And it did reconcile us to God. It did bring in everlasting righteousness. It opened the kingdom of God for anybody who would receive him. 
And now you have to know, you have to comprehend in your mind what an abomination it is to make another sacrifice. But it's Rome, the one who makes sacrifices every day, who wants you to believe in a modern nation state of Israel and the Jews making sacrifices in a rebuilt temple, which God has just frustrated for 70 years. God has thrown a monkey wrench into their their futurist pro- prophecy, their false prophecy called futurism, never mind that it's taught in every church in this land, every church in Europe, every Christian church all over the world, it's taught the futurist delusion. And the whole, Chris, whole of Christendom believes it. The whole of Christendom prays for the salvation of the Jews. Do you know how the Jews are going to be saved? By the shed blood of their own Messiah, Jesus. They're going to come to the cross just like you and me did, or there is no salvation for them. All you dispensationalists out there who ultimately teach that there's another form of salvation for the Jew than there is for the Gentile, you are all diabolical liars. The dispensation of grace began in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were issued coats of skins. God himself made a sacrifice and covered them with coats of skins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And God took care of Adam and Eve. He took care of Abel, and he condemned Cain because he was not a receiver of the blood of the Lamb of God. He made his own sacrifice with his own hands, the works of his own hands. That is exactly what the Roman Catholic Church does. You can't get it wrong. It just makes too much sense. You can't deny it. You can't gainsay it. You can't denounce it. You can't prove. Look, I'll leave it to the listeners to judge. Who's telling the truth? And where am I wrong? Where is Yerk wrong? Now that we know the truth, what is our obligation to the Heavenly Father? What is our obligation to the one who sacrificed his only begotten son that we might be saved? What is our obligation to him but to stop this diabolical futurist lie, this Roman Catholic futurist Zionist agenda? to deceive the whole world. It's up to us. And it if we can't do it, then God will cause the stones to cry out. You ever feel like you want to be a, 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 a member of God's army? <laughs> you've got your you've got your marching orders now. You've got your marching orders. So many, I want to be a part of God's army. They've written me and told me. You've got your marching orders now. Quit wishing for something you've already got. You know what the mission is, just like I do, and just like Yerk does. With knowledge comes responsibility. You can't pass this responsibility on to futurists because it goes against, the truth goes against everything they preach and teach. Back to you, Yerk. One of the most profound sentences you said in the last five minutes was that God provides the sacrifice. And that, exactly. reminded me, and that reminded me to, in the beginning of our playlist, uh, when it was still called uh, End Time Delusions by Steve Wahlberg, that book where he put four earlier works into one book together. And we spoke about the sacrifice that Abraham was to do with his son Isaac as you can see here in the picture. But all of a sudden, uh, a voice came and said, no, don't do it. And God provided a ram here in the picture as a sacrifice. God provides the one and only ultimate sacrifice. You don't have to uh, cut the throat of your own son. You don't have to make quote-unquote holocausts um, in this world to gain any salvation. You just have to accept the one and only gift and lamb that God provides. 
And that was here with Abraham, of course, not Jesus Christ yet. It was just the ram, just to take Abraham off the earlier given order to offer his son. But then, a few hundred years later, Jesus Christ came as the only begotten Son of God, and he volunteered as the lamb that stands here in the picture on the right. God provides the sacrifice. If any man provides the sacrifice, as you then said a little bit later, like Cain did when he brought his own works as a sacrifice, that won't be accepted. That is just something people have to get in their heads. And there is no two ways of salvation. If I remember correctly, this Acts chapter 4 verse 12. There is no other name given unto man under heaven by which you can be saved but the name of the man Christ Jesus. That's it. You want to save a Jew? Get him out of Israel. Bring him to your house. And tell him the gospel. But if you leave him in Israel, if you leave him in that modern nation state of Israel, he's going to believe a lie. He's going to believe that his salvation rests in a restored temple and a restored sacrifice. Just like they were doing in 70 AD when God sent the Roman 10th Legion to destroy the temple and the city and scatter the people to all the four winds. But why did he scatter them among the nations? So that the Gentiles can provoke them to jealousy for their own Messiah, who they wickedly slew 2,000 years ago. Where are they going to hear that message? But in the Gentile world. You are the salvation of the Jew. The gospel out of your mouth is the salvation, the only salvation for a Jew. Likewise, the gospel out of your mouth is the only salvation for a Roman Catholic. Their sacrifices are an abomination before the Lord. Their sacrifices are damnation. What else can be said? Actually, Tom, I thought we to take this quote from page 238 from the book from Edmond Paris as a starter for today's broadcast. But in the meantime, almost an hour has passed, and I think we should leave it at this and go next time back into the wonderful book from Steve Wolberg that we are still reading and discussing, Exploding the Israel Deception. We have left off last time on part uh, on the point number three that he mentions here, the end time regathering argument in the chapter eight, which is called 1948, an unsinkable doctrine, making a uh, a point in the direction of the uh, Titanic, this boat that was quote unquote unsinkable. But I think what we said now, Tom. Uh, has to stand on its own. I don't want to go into that book. We do that next time. But yeah. I think that today we really took the chance to go again into um, the gigantic Holocaust, as it is written here in the book from Edmond Paris, uh, The Vatican Against Europe. I mean, that's a book from 1961, you know? Yeah. And um, this is a book that people really should read. And I will put the link where you can get that book for free on archive.org in the description box of this video. So no, no one is with any excuse. Yeah, there's no excuse for anyone. You can right. just click and read it for yourself. You don't even have to buy it. You can freely download. It's more than 300 pages, but it's as far as I saw so far, a wonderful, wonderful work. And I think Miss Marple is going to translate the complete book into German and I'm eager to read it. I don't know when, because I got so many things to do, like Tom. And every time when we are gathering together for a study, like today, we wanted to continue in the study of the Exploding the Israel Deception by Steve Wahlberg, and you see what came out of it. But this was, I think, so important to say that I would like to end the broadcast here, Tom, and of course, leave you 
with the final words to our listeners. Messiah the Prince, 2,000 years ago, caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. That's not to happen in the future. Jesus did it 2,000 years ago. Anyone who suggests a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel is a Zionist, a Roman Catholic Zionist. I don't care what church he goes to. I don't care what denomination he professes. I don't care how eloquent all of his other sermons are. I don't care how righteous he is in his personal life. I don't care how accurately he holds to Scripture. He's telling a diabolical lie. He's carrying the water for the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of the Roman Catholic Church, the only real, true Zionist in the world. The Roman Catholic Papacy. That's the truth. By recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or uh, capital Israel. of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as G Genesis 12 says God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this, and then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And it's a miracle that it took place.